Well, why Denali? Why this climb at this time? I just want to see if I enjoy it. You know, can I, can I take it? Can my body take it? And do I enjoy it? And if and if I do, then maybe the next steps are you know in the Himalayas or something like that. My name is Sally Weir and I am 30 years old. And where are you from? I was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado. Aaron Michael Salome, 34, originally from Pennsylvania, lived in Colorado for 12 years. My name is Patrick Hutchinson, I'm 33 now and I'm from Denver, Colorado. Chris Kimmett, 32 years old, I'm from Boulder, Colorado and I live in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Uh, my name is Chris Schumann. I am 32 years old, originally from Louisville, Kentucky. Lived in Boulder for almost 10 years now. Jason Kochkowski, I'm 38. Originally I was born in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, didn't live there very long. I would consider Albuquerque where I grew up, and uh, now I'm from Denver, Colorado.
babysitter, a sweet talking night, walking games. Oh, she's known in the darkest clubs for pushing ahead of the dames. If she says she can't do it, then she can't do it. She don't make balls games. But she's a queen and such a queen that your laughter is sucked in the brain. We don't wander too far outside of this spot here. Well, that looks like a crevasse, like right next to it, in my opinion. So I think we should probe it. Right. Yeah, I think um, you know, for me, uh, climbing was uh, like a lot of things in life. It was a, you know something I did a, a little bit as a kid, and you kind of was forced to or, or encouraged to do from my parents and, and through Boy Scouts and with Eagle Scout and kind of really got into climbing a few 14ers or outdoor camping at that point in my life and then uh, went to college and kind of forgot all about it and then uh, <laughs> and then in 2007 Aaron and I decided to climb uh, Whitney kind of on the, um, I don't know, just for the heck of it and uh, really from there started getting back into climbing and it's kind of propelled from there and climbed uh, I think I'm. I think I'm personally. I don't know. Right around 38 or 40 of the 14ers in in Colorado, and then on top of that, did Kilimanjaro last year, and just kind of looking for the next steps. Uh, so I got into climbing mountaineering in a few years back, uh, climbing most of the 14ers here in Colorado. Uh, joined the CMC as I got into more challenging climbs um, to improve my technical skills. Um, Climb Kilimanjaro, climb Rainier, climb Kosciuszko. No, I don't know if that really counts, but um, that's pretty much it. And now on to Denali. And could you briefly describe your climbing experience? Um, most of it took off after I moved back from North Dakota, having missed the mountains, and uh, kind of didn't stop. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done all kinds of things. Lots of 14ers, fun snow climbs, and uh, now Denali. So I learned how to climb in Chamonix, um, right underneath Mont Blanc, and that kind of did it for me. I was hooked. I came back to the United States, to Kentucky, and realized Kentucky wasn't big enough for me anymore. <laughs> uh, so I moved to Colorado. Um, I climbed Rainier. I joined Hams. Um, Hams is Hams is the high altitude mountaineering school at the Colorado Mountain Club. So I I did that class as a student um, to meet partners. Um, and the very next summer I climbed in Peru. That winter I climbed in Ecuador. The next summer I climbed in Africa. Uh, and I've been instructing with the uh, high altitude mountaineering school for about five six years now. Uh, what is your climbing experience? Uh, it's not that extensive, really, um, but I've certainly dove into it with a passion. Um, I think my first summit was in 2009, so like six years ago. Um, it started out, my dad um, had lived in Longmont, Colorado back in 1973, and eventually he and his, he was just, he was there for nine months stationing in between work. Um, and so he and a bunch of friends attempted Long's Peak and uh, couldn't get up it. They got weathered off. In fact, they got caught in a lightning storm in the boulder field. There's like shrapnel of rock and what have you. Um, and then life intervened. You know, um, he had my older brother. Um, There's some moving around. Didn't live in high altitude places. Uh, so, gosh, um, it was 35 years later almost or something like that that um, he had moved back to Colorado and so had I. And it was time to try and climb Long's Peak. And so um, at the time, I was also dating my now wife, and she was a backpacker, not really a mountain climber. And so we decided, the three of us, to sort of prep for that. And so first we went up to a saddle of a 13er, and then we climbed a 15er, and then we climbed some easier 14ers, and we worked our way up longer, higher, longer, higher, until eventually we got Long's Peak. Um, and we did by the standard route, you know, nothing fancy, but it was this really positive emotional experience for me, and I think it really hooked me. 
Um, so since then, I've really gone in full bore. Um, I'm now an instructor in various ways. I'm a senior instructor for the Colorado Mountain Club High Altitude Mountaineering School. I'm also the director of their Advanced Crevasse Rescue Seminar, so I spend some time studying this stuff outside of my climbing experience. And, you know, that being said, I have been in climb six years. I have something like 105 summits now under my belt, so I've certainly, you know, gotten out. Um, and very recently have gotten into... Um, you know, more technical 13ers. Um, they're less traveled. There's a little more route finding. There's not a, a, an army of people to show you the way, and I kind of enjoy that. Um, I actually didn't start climbing until, oh, maybe uh, 10 years ago or so. I didn't do a lot of outdoor stuff prior to that. Um, I did a lot of rock climbing in Zion National Park or around there when I was a ranger there, um, but have always had a much more intense interest in mountaineering and glaciated environments. That's really my passion is snow and ice. So um, transitioned more into that. Took the high altitude mountaineering school at ha um, Hams at the Colorado Mountain Club. I did an alpine training course in New Zealand and the Southern Alps there. Uh, I've done Rainier, did an attempt on Aconcagua, climbed in various other places around the world. I've also done uh, Island Peak in Nepal. So. So we were supposed to be moving up to Camp 2 today, but um, the weather's been in and out, on and off. Um, not really a window long enough for us to move. Um, we really thought about it. In fact, we tore down most of the camp to get ready to go, and then the weather moved back in. Um, I talked to the weather guy. It looks like tomorrow will be more of the same, so we'll probably be staying here, although we might get lucky. Although Wednesday looks like it might be a good chance to move. Um, and at the end of the week, uh, about four or five days from now, it is looking pretty good. So maybe that will be our opportunity to uh, get the heck out of Camp 1. <laughs> um, meanwhile, we're eating um, chicken and dumplings. Actually pretty good. Um, it's been my view for most of the day. And most of tomorrow. Uh, so, but as they say, expeditions are, you know, mostly camping, and here we are, camping. sitting around day two. <laughs> um, just took a look outside. Uh, it's much like to be expected. We've got some light snow. It's um, Clouds are coming in and out, so there are moments where you go, hey, it's breaking, and then five minutes later it's not breaking anymore and it's rolled back in. Uh, the other teams seem to be doing what we're doing, uh, staring up the route, hopefully, <laughs> um, and deciding, eh, and then having some more coffee. So. What are you most concerned about regarding the climb? My biggest concern is just group fitness. Hopefully everybody's fit enough to move in a timely manner. And being cold. Yeah, and being cold. <laughs> For sure. Uh, most concerned about fatigue, um, keeping my things dry, um, but obviously weather. You know, I think there's a lot to weather is a huge one. I think. Um, now the weather's the big one for sure. What? <laughs> Number one, first and foremost, weather. At this point, weather. Uh, <sighs> so, Wednesday, nobody's moving. So we're digging in because we're about to have a gigantic ass storm Thursday and Friday. So we're building the snow walls. We're going to go ahead and dig into one of our comfort food meals, which will save us weight in the future, but also I think we could all use a morale boost right about now. <laughs> so a bunch of guided groups below us. Um, nobody's moving anywhere. Hey, look at the view over there, Jason. Look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at that. Came all this way to camp the Elevation of Evergreen. That's right. So we're about at the Elevation of Evergreen. We've been here 
three days. We're gonna be here two more. This is the greatest 3,000 mile camping trip ever. <laughs> and we have no views. So you wouldn't even really know we were in Alaska except for the fact that you have to rope up to throw your poo away. And it snows two feet a day. And it snows two feet a day. I guess that's true. <laughs> that's a little different. So uh, we're, we're hunkering down, as you can see, um, to ride out the next two days. Uh, looks like potentially Friday night we might be able to move, um, depending on how much snow falls between Thursday and Friday. And uh, maybe one of those guide groups lays a track. Well, our weather guy says storm. So... You know. Plus we're bored. <laughs> so it gives us something to do. We're going to be so protected, we're going to be like, storm? What storm? storm? <laughs> There's no storm. I don't see any storm. You. So if uh, one of those guide groups lays down a track Friday night, we might be able to get going. If they don't, and we have three fresh feet of snow, probably don't want to be the first group out of camp. That sounds painful. Um, so Friday night, Saturday morning, maybe we'll be one of those two. We'll be hopefully on our way up. Um, starts our wonderful weather window of being able to get stuff done. stuck in Talkeetna before this? No, we got on on Sunday afternoon uh -huh. and up to Camp One and then we yeah. sat until the... We, we were stuck in Talkeetna for five days. We got here in the afternoon. We flew in. Uh, we left at, at four in the morning, ripped up to Camp One, slept during the day, came up here about like 10.30. We no wonder like, you haven't gotten any higher. Yeah, and then just, we've been stuck here. And just sitting, just just sitting stuck in a tent. Here. It's yep. horrible. Like we went through the highs and the lows and we were like, okay, we're stoked. As soon as it breaks, we're going to, and then we're like, dude, we've got like nine days left. Like, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry to hear it, guys. Be safe on the way down. Yeah, you guys too. Good luck, man. I hope you guys have some good weather from here on out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? Oh, well, we're going down. So. Yeah, tough weather. Be safe. Uh, Might have to dig out another site. Yeah, we're gonna have to do some digging. As long as we don't go any faster than we were going. <laughs> yeah, I know. We slept on walking feet. Lord, we slept on walking feet. Oh, darling, pardon me. Can you help me remember when we were all flying free? We would dust 
from our bodies and we were flicker and flame Yeah, we burn till the morning We're gonna try to catch all the food yeah. in this day, right? As much as we can take. Yeah. We're gonna keep it. There's probably gonna be say day six as well. No, nope. four or five. Okay. So we need how many ounces of food? In the contingent. Of fuel, we need way. 40 ounces of liquid fuel, two canisters. Day four or five. No yeah. contingency days are staying because at the worst. Right now, it's yeah. supposed to be nice. That the worst we dig up our cash. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Do we even need these then, Jason, for anything? Nope. No, we don't need them. Nope. We'll, we'll need them for 17 and 8, like 17 or 16. Yeah, I mean, we, don't, we just don't need them now. We need them higher. Oh, we do need them higher. Yeah, we need them uh, higher. Yeah. So far, I haven't get contributed any of my weight. All right, we need to get Chris to contribute weight. Do <laughs> you want? Some of your liquid fuel. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, so take a moment while, before we get into what's moving up. And go ahead and get into your pack and get out all the shit that you're going to need for staying the night. Okay. And just go ahead and get that out. <clears throat> I can't hear you. To stay the night. Everything that you need for the actual camping and sleeping. Yeah. Just want to make sure. So they'll just have to watch theirs until we get back. Okay. How do you describe your uh, training and preparation experience? Uh, the process training, of going through that. Sure. Training's actually been fairly intense. Um, Still not sure if I'm ready. <laughs> no matter how hard you're training, you feel like you haven't trained hard enough. So kind of see how it goes. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to get uh, enough training in a gym, um, especially when you have a career and kids and family at home. Uh, so you get an hour here, an hour there where you can, and then try to get out on the weekends. And that's kind of been my regimen. What surprised you about that process, the process of getting ready for a big mountain like this? Uh, um, it's really boring to be on a stair stepper for an hour with 60 pounds on the back. I, I, I don't know how to entertain myself when I'm on a stair stepper. When you're running, at least you can run faster, slow down. Uh, it, it seems like you can kind of push yourself in a little bit different respect. On a stair stepper, it's just not there. <laughs> how would you describe the training and the preparation experience? Um, boy, it was long. <laughs> um, yeah, because I had originally wanted to do this climb a year ago and a knee surgery, my third um, ACL reconstruction on my right knee, um, stopped that in its track. So I've really been planning this for two and a half years. And, so, and then there was the physical rehabilitation on the back of that um, knee surgery. And then over the course of training for this climb, now this year, I had another setback with my knee in getting a pretty deep bone bruise, um, which really put me out of commission for a couple of months. And so there was a whole other rehab protocol on the back of that. So I've been basically doing physical rehabilitation on top of the logistical preparation and the, the, their physical training for you know, two and a half years. And so I'm pretty tired. <laughs> um, I'm pretty tired of it, I guess, I'm sort of mentally and emotionally. And getting up every day and forcing yourself to go through that um, was um, was trying, and so at that point, you know, at this point, I should say, just getting on the mountain, I think, would be a relief. <laughs> Commitment, I would say, is the main word. Um, some people describe that climbing this mountain as being a marathon mountain, doing a marathon climb. I would say training for it is also a marathon. You can't start a month ahead of time and be ready. It's been a year of solid commitment every day going out and training and, and really sticking to it and having a plan to graduate through different scales and different stages of training so it's been a long road and three pounds of the pack makes 75 
Take a flyer. Good for you. How you feel? All right. How about you? Good. Back sore. Yeah, my back's a little sore too. No, I guess what I'm saying is doing the butcher ring. Yeah, back. right. Either way, I don't think we're gonna. Um, it really becomes a matter of whether or not we feel it's safe and if we have the energy to do a 4,000 foot day that high. That's what it could, either way yeah. it's going to take the same number of days. Yeah. If we don't just go from 14 to 17 and then straight up, if we go from 14 to 17 cash and down. See, I'd be okay with just, well, I mean, taking a rest day when everyone gets to 14 and then doing 17 and from 17 go the next day. That? Trying to single carry all the way up there would have been so fucking miserable. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. So you guys are 14 right now? Yeah, we just got there. Well, I got okay. there a couple hours ago. How many people are up there? A lot. There's, there's, a, there's a fair amount. Way more than 11. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully the, somebody will move down tomorrow. You guys can snipe their spot. Did that wind remind you of the Quandary Hut trip? So that wind was nothing compared to what I told you about the trip on Quandary. was way yeah. worse than anything there. Yeah, actually I was thinking more about Chimborazo. Quandary was worse. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Quandary was? Quandary's a nasty little bastard. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever been in a quandary when it wasn't windy. Now, luckily, the Cristo Cool shelters you, but once you get to the top... For my radio, I'm Kimbo. Everything that was on the outside of my pack, so my ice axe is in my hand, my radio is here, my ticket, they all got um, high altitude frost, you know, like yeah. when the airplane wing glazes over. Yeah. I, when I came back down, there was like 
got a quarter inch of uh, just frozen solid there. That was my experience too. And it wasn't snowing. It was just a uh, blowing. Yeah. It's like it got air cooled. It was seriously like the on Nice, small guide service steps. <laughs> Except for a couple, I mean, there's a couple stretches of like 50, 100 linear feet where it's not, but. Basically leaving the parking lot at Tories and taking our sleds all the way to the top. Kinda. Except it's prettier. It is a lot prettier. And you'll notice that it's a little more tiring. <laughs> It gets easier though. Second, everyone has the radios on. After that. Yes. Radios on, everyone. Second hill kind of sucks. The first hill sucks. The first hill sucks. The second one sucks for a different reason. And then the third hill sucks because it's the third hill. And then the fourth hill we never bothered getting to yesterday, so I'm pretty sure it's gonna suck. <laughs> Other than that, it's all gonna be great. Woo! Cool. We all ready? Tally ho. Tally ho. Just remember, we do this for fun. Yeah, you too. It's just about 45 minutes. Wow. It's pretty good. Oh yeah, we're not in any hurry. Get food, get water. I'm gonna make a phone call. It's nice and calm and warm over here. How time is it, Jason? 4.15. Perfect timing. Yeah. We're crushing it. We are crushing it. What are we worried about? Oh, worried just about maybe putting up three since we're gonna spend some time here. Rest Please, it. What, what are your thoughts? Are down. you thinking that you're gonna go up and cash tomorrow? We haven't. We, let's set up the okay. tent before we. Yeah. Talk about that. Let's let's get the two set up that we. Need. So everyone's clear because I kind of talk to everyone individually, right? So today is just rest and eat and go to the edge of the world. Tomorrow. We go up and we cache on the buttress. Tuesday we go up to the rib. Wednesday's now summit day. And we go down as low as we can on Wednesday. If we can get all the way back down here, great. Thursday we pick up our cache and move all the way down again as far as we can. 
glute. Nobody needs water? You can Not throw yet. some in here. Right, well, the goal is base camp around Friday if the storm allows. Yes. Um, how do you reconcile the risk of climbing with, you know, having a life and people who care about you? Uh, because risk is something that truly we can't control. For me, it would be more important to have a really great, you know, few years than a really lousy dozens of years. Um, so the risk for me is, is part of the life. The risk, um, I've done quite a few risky things in my life, and I actually don't think climbing is that risk. It, it puts myself at that much risk. I mean, I was in the military, I was on, in two deployments, I used to skydive. I don't feel like, like climbing a mountain puts myself at that much risk. I don't think you can. Um... I've been, again, as I get closer, particularly with the new kids, as I get closer and closer to this climb, I've been asking myself that question a lot more. And right now, anyway, you know, ask me a week from now, maybe I feel differently. But right now, anyway, I think that the notion of reconciling the risk is just a, a big rationalization. That, you know, there are, yeah, there are certain things that I could die in a car accident, but that's sort of mandatory for daily living. And I'm, I'm choosing to elevate my personal risk profile. Um, in a way that I don't have to. And so really, it's I think you're trying to balance this, are you being selfish versus are you actually finding some sense of fulfillment and how much is that fulfillment worth to you? Um, and how much is it worth to your family? And can they come along with you, you know, emotionally? Can you climb smart? Yes. Can you climb conservatively when it comes to risk? Yes. Can you climb well and mitigate that risk? Absolutely. Is it still more risky than doing other things? Yes. Um, so maybe you don't. Maybe you don't reconcile it. Maybe you just accept that you're doing something that maybe isn't quite sane. <laughs> up above and the helicopter came and I was eye level with the pilot as they lowered a winch down to the climber <laughs> and then as soon as he was clipped in they went <clears throat> and he's just hanging by this winch going the 1953 expedition to K2 with, as tragic as it was, with um, a sense of, of awe, and I, I derive some inspiration there um, from that. And you, you can talk about the miracle belay and, and all that sort of stuff, but really strikes me is how hard the team tried to get our Gilkey down. The team really came together to deal with a, a tragic situation. So much so that there's a number of people who think, they don't know for sure, but there's a number of people who think that Art Gilkey, who, when they were lowering down on the sled, eventually cut himself free, basically killing himself, because he thought the risk that his teams, that his teammates were making was too high. Now, certainly would I want someone who I'm rescuing to do that? No, absolutely not, but it, it, it tells you how much everyone was in it for everyone else. Um, and so I look at, at that climb as sort of the model of team dynamics. Can I just walk up? Or? Yeah. <laughs> you look at it from here and you're like, I can do this. <laughs> yeah. I, I never said I couldn't do it. Huh? I know. And a question yeah, that it was it. No, just it a us. question about. No. <laughs> do we, um. No, I won't even ask. No, go ahead. I yeah. mean, if one person, you know, if we get to the football field and one person's not going to make the summit, then there's like, we can do two and four kind of thing? Potentially, yeah. Okay. 
Look at this, man. This is... I know, isn't this outrageous? Little, uh, yeah, can we walk good. around here? Like, walk off well, to... Well, it looks like people are down here a lot. We've taken 125 pounds, up 7,000 feet. And there were times that were hard. And there were times that we got tired. And there were times that we got on each other's nerves. And there's the fear of the unknown. And there's the weather, and there's the everything has to go right. And all of those doubts that you have in your head. But I chose the five of you. I believe in the five of you. I think we can do this. In fact, I'm more confident right now than I have been at any point in the entire trip. I think we can do this. And so I think the time for doubting each other and the time for second guessing and the time for wondering what could we have done differently and is there a better path? And the answer is probably yes, there is something we could have done better. And yes, we could have done something differently. But we're here now and we've got something incredibly fun and hard and rewarding to do. And I think we all need to believe in each other just a little bit more. So I would appreciate it, personally, if we could find a way. I think we've had some important conversations. I don't regret having them. We need to have those conversations. But if we can get ourselves to start believing and supporting and not so much wondering and doubting, if we can do that, I think the six of us can get up this route, down that one, and back here safely. Coming on And I am once I am twice I am the whole I'm just a slave Some call me gone Some call me here None are wrong None are near I am right now I am back then I will return Don't ask me when Disappointed kiss I am the unexpected harvest I am the old Kentucky home I am the sun who runs the farthest I have done wrong I will do wrong There's nothing wrong with doing wrong And I am faith I am belief Except for when I'm not Of champions, I am rust and water rotten. And I am sleep, I'm breathing, I'm the missing of the passing seasons. I am the brother. I am the stroke, some sickness come to the best of folks. I am renewed, I am just made, I am unchanging. I'm a pasture fenced about the edge, I am Dakota Thunder raging. And by my shoes and by my feet and by my soul and wonder. tracks we've laid above, I am the tunnel running under
worried about the way you look. You came on the wrong trip. <laughs> yeah, I hope the mountaineering does not lend itself towards high fashion or sexiness. For instance, my Lawrence of Arabia terrorist hat <laughs> that I have on. Right. Functional, yes. Sexy, no. So speaking of Denali, why that mountain now? What about that climb? Why that mountain now? Um, it probably wasn't first on my list, but when I found out you were putting together the trip, uh, and I, I knew that we have a good team, I decided that it was the right time. <laughs> Well, say goodbye to 14 camp for a couple nights. Safety check, everybody's double backed. Yep. All yep. clips are on. Yep. Everything's locked. Everything is locked. We're just over 15. Oh. I know. Talking like we used to do. It was always me and Shaping up and shipping out Check me in and check me out Do you like walking in the How's everyone feeling? Good. Good. good yeah, I feel good. <coughs> so, what's that? The elevation is wrong. We're at... I want to get a picture of our rod is basically up over those rocks <coughs> and yep. right underneath that cornice, isn't it? Is that right? It's the look. left of the cornice, I think. Yeah. I think the cornice is the edge of the football field. Rock and chocolate flavor. Yeah. yeah. So we'll probably hug the rock underneath that. Yeah, you hug the rock. Go to the left. The further left you go, the more you bail out left on Archdeacon's Tower. And if you stay just right. So look. Um, well, we have to stay low because of the corners. See you in the marketplace. Walking around at 8 a.m. I got two hours before my flight. Luck be on my side tonight. Yeah, the reason that I feel so strong. Take your time. All right, Chris, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, climb. Most badass shit I've ever done! Let's go. My calf's burning.
filming this? Yep. Nice week, Chris. Thanks. Very nice of you. What do you see? What a fucking campsite. <laughs> sure the fuck beats the hell out of 17 too. Oh my god. Thank you, Jason. My yeah. mom, my mom's gonna fucking shit herself. Can I like change layers? Yep. Home tackets. Yeah, we're gonna start making camp, so yeah. Get tethered. Let's do a safety check. Double backed. Hey guys, do a safety check. I think uh, being humble is something that's very important to me in my climbing because you have to be aggressive, you have to um, be committed and work hard and be willing to push through challenges and, and hard spots and tough spots, but at the same time you are secondary to the mountain, so I think you have to be able to balance that um, drive and that willingness to push through hard things with patience when the mountain is telling you that this is not your time and listening to those bigger forces. Yeah, we are. Oh, yeah, like, 
if we go up the middle of this thing? No, we're not going to go up there. Right. They'll stop until you get to the bottom. No, we're not going to go up the middle. We're going to go angle a little, and kind of to the point of those rocks, and across. not supposed to get bad with wind for like the next 36 hours we just got to make sure we keep our bodies in enough shape Gang, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> One more push. what are we as uh, individuals or what are we as humans even capable of and I think that's what are you know originally in the sport I think that's what a lot of people who have uh, some of the peaks uh, that known that people look at before and said it will never happen have said is this a man can climb this a human being can climb this and I'm going to do it and I think finding that uh, that challenge and saying listen this is not something everybody can do but I'm going to push myself I'm going to challenge myself and I'm going to see what I, I'm made of and, uh, and truly testing that and, and finding it out. And then I think you get up there and it's, you know, you and, and in a lot of ways it's you and God. And, and you just, you know, what what can you do? What is your will? You know, you left comfort and you left, you know, easy at home. And, and it's still all about just grinding and, and getting through and, and challenging yourself.
job. Whew, thank you. How are you feeling? I feel okay. Tired. Yeah. All right, here we go. There we go. Nice job, Jason. Thank you. Sally, can you take one of Jason and I? Yeah. Or Chris? You could get the marker, marker and the yeah. backdrop. Tally ho. Okay? Yeah, everything's all right. I think we should just glissade this mother. <laughs> <laughs> be a little rough on the ass, it's a little bumpy. I froze in my backpack, so I need to collect carabiners. Leave this one. Leave this one. Thank you. 
If I wasn't in so much pain, I think I'd enjoy the view. <laughs> this is to our right. There are no views to our left. Get it, bro. Okay. It is pretty unreal. Right, yes, I'm sir. Ready. Bro. All of these are our carabiners. Okay. Sally, they're all ours. Okay. Okay. So hopefully. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Your rope looks twisted underneath you. <laughs> Oh, I can't just turn around. Yeah. So get it on the ground here. Well, probably the easiest thing for me to do is unclip my sled and just turn around. So, well done, Jason. Okay. Hold on. Okay. You know, I like to push the boundaries of my comfort zone. Um, I like to, well, here you go. I, I guess this would be, I think it's important to learn how to suffer gloriously. And so whenever I am suffering, I always try to put a positive spin on it and try to do it gloriously, however. <laughs> Here? Like behind in the back back corner right here where it wraps around your pack. Ah. It's wanting to pull it. Ah. 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 Ah.
half a sec. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not, not so fast. Okay. I mean, it's got to be foot by foot. I am breaking the entire line. I'm literally at a 45 degree angle back against the slope. This is, Chris, turn around. This is my walking angle. I can only go so fucking fast, so fucking hard like this. Why not make it fast and hard? <laughs> it's more fun that way. F-U-N. Yes, is this the part that your brother and you would be saying is the F-U-N part? Yeah. Yep. Especially those hills. That would have been like super capital F-U-N. Oh, we're there. So why do you climb? It's something I've been asking myself more and more as I've gotten more and more serious. And I'm not sure the answer will ever be fully evolved. Um, there's a whole package. Um, I like the planning. I'm a planner. Um, I, so I like that sort of confronting yourself with a series of logistical problems. How can I mitigate as much risk as possible? So I like that. Um, there's a spiritual component to me, that sort of zen-like state that I was talking about and being able to be really present. Um, in ways that maybe your regular life don't allow you. Um, there's just the visual. I mean, seeing things that are that incredibly beautiful um, is, you know, very inspiring to me. Um, there's also a lot of self-discovery and self-growth, hopefully, if I'm doing it right. Um, you have to combat things. You have to combat fatigue and uh, fear and um, doubt, self-doubt. Um, and so it forces a certain level of self-awareness. And so that, that's, I guess that's also part of sort of the spiritual growth for me that comes to going, that comes with going into the mountains. Have a good climb. What are you thinking, Chris?
Yeah, I know. Oh, <laughs> 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 